Hello friends, welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook and here today to give a presentation on the subject of when God disrupts the world. When God disrupts the world. And I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to this short article. Let me go ahead and jump into this. Uh, now, pastors who preach the gospel of grace and accurately teach God's word are dangerous men, at least from the worldly perspective, they're dangerous men. From God's perspective, they're wonderful men. They're great men. But from the worldly perspective, they are, in fact, dangerous men. And this because they will disrupt your worldly thinking and cause great damage to your human viewpoint perspective. And really, they should. Really, they should. Pastors are told to preach the Word. Preach the Word, 2 Timothy 4.2 tells us. And Ephesians 4.15 says that we are to speak the truth in love. Always to speak the truth. Now, to do it in a loving way, to do it in a compassionate way, but to do it in a way that seeks God's best in the life of the other person. And sometimes seeking the best, uh, God's best in the life of another person means giving them information that may disrupt their worldview or their understanding of things. And again, sometimes this needs to happen. Now, if exposed to their teaching for any period of time, you'll experience an epistemological shift that will fundamentally shake the foundations of your metaphysical and ethical views on life. Now, there's a lot going on there, so let me, let me unpack this a little bit. So, if exposed to their teaching for any period of time, that is, to biblical teaching, you'll experience an epistemological shift uh, that will fundamentally shake the foundations of your metaphysical and ethical views on life. Epistemology is a field of study that raises the question of how do you know what you know? How do we acquire knowledge? And I went through this epistemological shift back in the early 90s. I didn't know it was happening at the time. It was a good thing <laughs> for me, uh, but I, I was not aware and at the time, I was uh, linked in, I was hooked in with a form of Christianity that was really uh, Pentecostal, charismatic, where a lot of how I thought I understood things was based on emotion or based on a mystical view of, of life in the world. Um, and so I started listening to a Bible teacher. He was a verse-by-verse -verse Bible teacher out of Houston, Texas, uh, a very godly man, a very excellent verse-by-verse uh, -verse Bible teacher. And over a period of several years, the way that he approached the scripture, looking at the original languages, history, culture, uh, and looking at the scripture from the time in which the author wrote to his original audience, that when I began to listen, a little by little it began to shift my thinking in how I came to know what I know. And I moved away from emotion and sort of that mystical view on life, and I took much more of a, a reasoned approach to the scripture. And God is reasonable, and the scriptures are reasonable. In fact, Isaiah 118, God says, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let us reason together. But then over in Isaiah 55, he says, but my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so God says, let us reason together, but let's reason uh, from my perspective, from my way of thinking. And this causes us to be challenged in our thinking, to rise up, uh, to reach up in our thinking, and to try to understand life in the world from the divine perspective and not merely from the human perspective. And so this becomes the challenge. Now, obviously, God's thinking is infinite, and we are very finite, and you cannot pour the ocean into a thimble, and so you cannot fit all of God's knowledge into our uh, into this limited space here. And so reason will take us to a certain point, and then at, uh, at a certain point, we live by faith. Faith is not a leap into the dark. It's not a leap into the unknown. It is trusting uh, God, that what he says is true, even though we can't fully fathom all that that means. We know what it means, because faith is always, faith is a transitive verb. It means it demands a direct object. And so we reason the scriptures, and we know what God tells us, and we trust him at his word, and we are obedient to his word. But when we go through this epistemological shift and we have a, a shift in the orientation of the way that we receive knowledge, how we think about knowledge, 
this fundamentally shapes uh, the foundations of our metaphysical and ethical views on life. Metaphysics is the study of ultimate reality. And so uh, when I get into the Word of God, the Word of God uh, shifts the way that I understand the origin of things. Uh, that, first of all, the Bible assumes the existence of God. It starts off with Genesis 1-1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so it starts off with this presentation that God exists. It assumes the existence of God. And so when I'm getting into the Word of God, I learned that God exists, that He is uh, intelligent, that He is powerful, that He is all, always present, that is, He is omnipresent, and that He brought everything into existence. Now you think about uh, that opening statement there, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens there is the vast universe, the vast universe. Now on a very conservative level, uh, I've heard it said that there are roughly a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Uh, and sometimes I've heard as many as two to four hundred billion, although I'm not sure how you how you measure that perfectly. Uh, but on the conservative end, I've heard that there's a hundred billion stars in our galaxy and that there are, again, on the conservative end, a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. And you think about how vast that is. And at a moment in time, God just simply spoke and bam, it all came into existence. But it says that he created the heavens and the earth. And the Hebrew text there reads, uh, But in the beginning, God created bara. He created ex nihilo. He created out of nothing. And so God simply spoke and it came into being. He is the source of what is. And so he created the earth, but he created the earth special. And he created light and darkness, and he, cre and he separated the waters from the land, and he created plant life and animal life and ocean life. And, and then on the last day, he creates human life. And human life is special. Human life is very special because only people, male and female, are said to be made in the image of God. That is, that we are finite analogs to God. Uh, we are theomorphs, as it were. We are made in the image of God, and there's something special about mankind that we have the ability to think and feel, and we have a conscience, a sense of morality, and we have a volition, the ability to choose based upon reason, based upon a sense of morality. And so mankind is special, made in the image of God. And so as I began to think about things from the biblical perspective, uh, I realized that everything came into existence because God, uh, the intelligent designer creator, brought it into being, and therefore it has order. And so I began to understand the ultimate reality of things, uh, the origins of the universe, the origin of mankind, the origin of sin, the fall, uh, the promise of redemption, uh, and that history is going somewhere, that God is directing history because Christ is coming back. He will rule on the throne of David in the millennial kingdom. And so you realize that history is going somewhere and that God is providentially moving the circumstances of this world to move history to the place to where Christ will come back. And you realize that you exist for a reason, that you're in this world because God brought you into the world. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, "...it is the Lord God who has made us and not we ourselves." and that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, And the body shall return to the dust, and the soul, the ruach, shall return to God who gave it, to return to God who gave it, because God gives us uh, our soul life. There are no accidental people in the world. There are no accidental people. Now, from the human perspective, we might say accidental. I sometimes uh, think that my parents brought me into the world. I don't think they were thinking about it. At least there wasn't much intention and planning. But nonetheless, God gave me soul life at the moment of conception. And so God imparted this life to me, and he knew my life and the course of my life, and he has a purpose and a plan for me. And it started with me coming to faith in Christ, believing that Jesus is my Savior, trusting that his death, burial, and resurrection is sufficient for my salvation and that I simply trust in Him and Him alone to save me. And at the moment of salvation, I'm forgiven all of my sins. I'm given eternal life, the gift of righteousness. I'm adopted into the family of God. I have a portfolio of spiritual assets. Ephesians 1.3 makes very clear that God has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that I'm given a spiritual gift, that I have a purpose and a place in this world, that the duration of my days are determined by the Lord. 
Psalm 139, verse 16, David says, You have ordained all the days of my life, when as yet there was not one of them. And so before David even existed, God had cordoned off the days of his life from beginning to end. And that's true for all of us. That is true for all of us. So from my understanding of the Word of God, I not only have a, a view of the origin of things and the flow of things and where history will will we'll finally uh, come to, but I also understand that I have a place in this world, and this creates within me a personal sense of destiny uh, that is very helpful because it allows me to rise above the mundane things of this life and realize that I am a child of the living God, that I am a brother to the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that I am part of this royal family, and it speaks to the honor code that I am to live by and how I am to conduct myself in this world. It's very, very practical. Very, very practical. And it was, again, when I got into studying the Word of God, and it took me places, I had no idea I was going to go. And it revealed to me things that I would have never imagined in a million years would I have imagined the things that God would have opened up to me from His Word, simply from His Word. And you realize that there are realities behind the physical reality, uh, that there are spiritual forces at work, and uh, and and that there are uh, holy angels that are working in God's creation, that he has elected them to be part of his plan to move history somewhere, and that he involves us as well, but that there are enemy forces and spiritual forces, Satan and demons and evil spirits that work behind the scenes. And again, God gives us these insights. He pulls back the curtain. He gives us these glimpses into realities that we could never know, except that God has spoken, and what he has spoken has been recorded for us. So we talk about revelation, we talk about inspiration and illumination. The Holy Spirit opens our minds and helps us to understand this. And he does it through a direct reading of the Word, but he also does it through gifted men that he's given to the church. Uh, men who are pastors and teachers who have this ability to dig into the Word of God and to mine out these truths and to present them in a systematic way, and to present them in a very clear way. Now, whether or not people accept them or not accept them, whether they are positive or negative, well, that's not up to me. I'm responsible for output, not outcomes. Uh, but nonetheless, the Bible really just shifts my whole worldview on literally everything. Everything, how I see a plant, how I see an animal as part of God's uh, creation. There's purpose, there's design there, not merely the accidental collection of molecules of matter, motion, time, and chance, but that there's intentionality there, there's purpose. I may not, when I pick up a rock, I may not understand fully God's purpose for it, but I know that it has purpose because it comes from an infinite personal creator, God, who brought it into being for part of his plan. And so again, I have this major fundamental shift with regard to how I understand things metaphysical and my ethical views on life. How do I conduct myself? How do I carry myself in this world? I don't live by the world's values, at least I shouldn't. And that's a challenge for me as a Christian because I'm still seeking to unseat a lifetime of human viewpoint and to replace it with divine viewpoint. And I'm, I'm struggling with an old sin nature and a new nature that are at war with each other. And I'm confronted with human viewpoint thinking that comes to me from various sources, from television, literature, music, radio, conversations I have with people, and I'm always on guard. I'm always trying to guard my heart to make sure that what comes in uh, derives from the Word of God or agrees with the Word of God and is not going to be antithetical and create a cognitive dissonance that can throw me into a tailspin if I let it. So I'm always careful about what I expose myself to, but it affects my ethical views on life, how I treat people, and that if somebody does me wrong, that I love my enemies that I pray for those who persecute me, uh, that I don't react, but rather that I respond, that I adhere to the royal family honor code, that I conduct myself according to the high calling of my uh, position in Christ. And I'm about to do an article on that very issue that's going to touch on that, uh, which has to do with our high calling of being in Christ. But I am told, do not seek your own revenge, beloved, Romans 12 says. But leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And so as a Christian, the Bible uh, shifted my worldview concerning my ethics, how I treat people, how I see people, how I conduct myself. And trust me, this can be a challenge. This can be a challenge because emotion can flare and I can be really upset over something. Uh, but I must always be careful to let the Word of God govern my behavior, my thoughts, my words and actions, and not my emotions. 
I think of 2 Timothy 2.24 and following, which says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Now, I used to quarrel. Boy, <laughs> boy, did I love to argue with people and, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And I have moved way away from that. But again, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, and with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. But how I conduct myself, I'm not to be quarrelsome, but I'm to be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, and with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Uh, There's no place for having a fist-in-your-face attitude when dealing with uh, unbelievers or people that are operating in human viewpoint. We have to conduct ourselves as the Scripture speaks. So again, I go back to this statement that if exposed to their teaching, to biblical teaching, to correct solid biblical teaching for any period of time, that you'll experience an epistemological shift that will fundamentally shake the foundations of your metaphysical and ethical views on life. Now, the blessed result will be a radical new way of thinking built on the foundation of God and His Word. And we have Jesus to thank for such good men. And those who support these teachers through prayer, through encouragement, and through financial support are really accomplices to their, to their disruptive activities and will be, appropriately re, uh, will be appropriately rewarded by God both in time and in eternity. Now, biblically, God has a, well-estab- has a well-established pattern of disrupting the lives and activities of sinful people. From Genesis 3, we know that God disrupted and dispelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they'd sinned. Now, you can read Genesis 3, 1 through 3, where Satan comes into the Garden, and he tempts the first couple, Adam and Eve, to sin against God and to disobey the Lord. And sometimes we we think, oh, well, you know, they just ate forbidden fruit. You know, how is that such an egregious sin? And I was thinking about it the other day, and I was thinking about... How those who walk close to God, how those who walk close to God and are near God, are held to a higher standard. For example, if you were to study ancient Israel, you would realize uh, that there are like concentric circles of holiness as one came near to the Lord, and you had Gentile nations on the outside. But once you got within the covenant community, there was a standard of expectation that was set forth in the Mosaic Law. And I'm currently teaching through Deuteronomy, and uh, and you get to the place to where uh, God makes it, Moses makes it very clear. He says, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Blessing if you obey the Lord, the curse if you disobey. But you get into Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 1 through 14, God says, if you obey me, I'll bless you. And then verses 15 to the end of the chapter, verse 68, he says, I will curse you if you disobey me. And now that was was blessing and cursing that was given only to the nation of Israel because they were in a covenant relationship with the Lord and had the law, had the 613 uh, laws pertaining uh, to God's laws as a theocratic kingdom. And so they had this information and they were held to a higher standard than the Gentile nations because of their relationship with the Lord. But even within the covenant community, as one came near to the tabernacle or the temple, one could come into the courtyard and bring sacrifices, and you were met by a priest. Now, the priests were part of the tribe of Levi, and they had to be a certain age, between 25 and 50. They had to be physically uh, stout men. They couldn't have any deformities because the demands of being a priest in ancient Israel was quite rigorous. You were handling animals, some of them very heavy. You were uh, working on the altar day after day, and I'm sure it smelled like a barbecue as you approached the tabernacle because of all the flesh that was cooking. But when one got into the tabernacle, one was drawing near, nearer to God. Now, the, the priests, the everyday priests, would come into the holy place. Now, the holy place, when you get into the tabernacle or the temple, it was divided into two parts. You had, the, you had the first room that you came into that was called the holy place, or the Kodesh. And this is where the priests would come in, and they, were, they would see the menorah, they would see the uh, table of showbread and the altar of incense. And when they would come in, uh, there was a holy place there. Now, there was a curtain 
that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And only once a year, only once a year, the high priest could come into the Holy of Holies. And this was on the Day of Atonement when he had sacrificed an animal for his own sins and then one for the sins of the people. And he would come in on that one day and he would open the curtain and the smoke from the altar of incense would billow into the room. And he would see the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top and the two cherubim reaching over the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the Holy of Holies. And to go in there once a year and to sprinkle blood upon the top of the mercy seat uh, was an activity that was limited only to the high priest. If anybody else went in there, he was a dead man. And not only that, but if you back out to the holy place, when if a priest brought uh, unauthorized fire or strange fire, uh, then that person would be struck dead. And you have an example of that over in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where Nadab and Abihu, two of Aaron's sons, brought unauthorized fire or strange fire into the holy place and God struck them dead. Because to be in that relationship where one is closer to God means that you are held to a higher standard than others. Because you are walking very close to the Lord. Now, walking close to the Lord comes with great blessing and great privilege, but it also comes with great responsibility. Great responsibility. And I think this is one of the reasons why James in 3 1 says, Be not many of you teachers, knowing that you shall incur the stricter condemnation, because you're held to a higher standard as one who is a communicator of the Word of God. Why do I mention this? Because when you think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they walked with God daily. Daily they walked with the Lord. They were with Him and would walk with Him. He would appear in theophonic form that there was some physical manifestation that God would take. And you have these appearances, these theophanies, these appearances of God throughout the Bible from Genesis early on and throughout, where God would appear in human form. But nonetheless, because Adam and Eve walked with God, because they had direct revelation from the Lord, because they were in such an intimate relationship with Him, they were held to a higher standard. So we think of the eating of the forbidden fruit as, you know, well, it's just fruit. You know, how is that such a big deal? It's a big deal because they had a very, very special relationship with the Lord. And so the sin that they committed was that egregious. It was that much of an offense because of their relationship with the Lord, because they walked with Him. And so at the moment that they partook of the forbidden fruit, they experienced spiritual death. Now later they would experience physical death, and death means separation, by the way, and they experienced a separation from God in time. Now, that would have extended into eternity, except that they were born again, that they received the provision of God. I think that their uh, moment of being born again occurred when they received the animal skins that God provided. But my point is, is that when you get down to the end of Genesis chapter 3, you have this recording where God pronounces curses upon, uh, upon the serpent. He pronounces curses upon the woman. Uh, with regard to child labor and with regard to her relationship with her husband. And God curses the ground so that Adam would have to work the ground by the sweat of his brow. He would have to produce more energy and would yield uh, a lesser result as a, uh, as a result of his labor. And so you have the curse placed upon the creation. But then God, after disrupting their lives, he then expels them from the garden. If you look at Genesis 3, 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden, sent him out to cultivate the garden from which he was taken. In verse 24, So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction, to guard the way to the tree of life. And so after uh, he disrupted their world, he divided them and separated them out from the garden. And he placed an angel there with a flaming sword that prohibited them from going back in. And the sword there was a picture of capital punishment. Moving on here, when we think about how God quarantined Noah and his family in the ark, because remember that the sinfulness of man upon the world was great in those days. 
And I think of uh, in Genesis uh, 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. That is just mind-blowing. And as a result, the Lord was sorry that he had made man upon the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And he said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made man. And then you have this expression of grace where it says, but Noah found chen, he found favor, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But nonetheless, because of the sinfulness of man, God was going to disrupt the world of mankind. And so God brought a universal flood. But in bringing this disruption upon the world, he divided out Noah, his wife, three sons and three daughters. And so he separated them out uh, by means of a flood, again, disrupt and divide. In Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, we have where God comes down to the Tower of Babel and he confused the languages of those who were building the Tower of Babel, disrupting their activity and scattering them geographically. Remember that after the, uh, after the flood, when God had brought Noah out of the ark to repopulate the earth, the command was to go into all the world. So they were to populate the whole earth. Well, the people, by the time you got several generations down, uh, you have those at the Tower of Babel who disobeyed that command to go out, and they gathered together. And they devised a plan that they were going to make a name for themselves, that they were going to build this tower that reached up into heaven. It was a form of spiritual insanity, uh, but that's what it was. And so anyway, uh, they God comes down and he sees what they're doing. And it's it's very ironic language. It's, it's condescending. He condescends. He comes down. It's like he has to stoop down to see their little project. They think it's a big project. And God has to stoop down to see the little thing that they're doing. But when God realizes, and of course he always realizes, this is anthropomorphic language, uh, and so God condescends and he comes down and he looks at what they're doing, and, uh, and what is going on there at the, table about, at the Tower of Babel is that they are using God-given language. God-given language. And remember that God used language among the members of the Trinity back in Genesis 1, and 27, where God said, let us talking to the other members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they said, let us make man in our image and let them rule. And so there's conversation going on. So language existed uh, amongst the members of the Godhead. And when God created Adam and Eve, when he created them, he created them with the ability to talk. In fact, he created everything in a state of maturity, the trees, the animals. If we had walked into the Garden of Eden on day seven, we would see everything in a state of maturity. We would not have thought of a tree that was a couple days old because it was fully mature, yielding fruit. And remember that light travels at 186,000 miles per second, I believe, and yet we have stars and galaxies that are billions of light years away. Well, how can that be? Well, God stretched out the light so that it was immediately visible to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They could immediately see the stars uh, because of the light that had been stretched out for their eyes to, to see. But when God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, and it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the Neshama Chaim, and Adam became a living soul at that moment. And five minutes after God had created Adam, he was fully developed, and God had instilled in him, had imputed into him, a bank of vocabulary that allowed Adam to immediately be able to engage God in conversation. And again, when we think about the normal process of development, of of growing and learning and developing mentally, emotionally, socially, and so on, uh, we think of a normal process that's part of our life experience. But you can't project that back upon the Genesis account. Uh, That is is something that is being done by God. We would say it's supernatural. For God, it's natural. I mean, you know, God, there's a question, can, can God do miracles? Well, from the human perspective, we say yes, but from God's perspective, it's just God being God. He's just, he's just doing what he does. Uh, but nonetheless, if we'd have walked into the garden five minutes after Adam was, was created and having a conversation with God... Our fundamental assumptions about the way we think of birth and development would not apply to that situation. We would not look at him and think five minutes old. And yet, nonetheless, when God created him, he created him in a state of maturity. But language was something that God gave to man. 
And so at the Tower of Babel, you had people using language, language that God gave to mankind for relationship with him, for relationship with each other, to accomplish his purposes in the world. And what you have here is you have a perversion of language. You have language being used contrary to the way that God intended it to be used. And so they were using language for sinful purposes, contrary to God's intention. And not only that, but they were using resources. They were, uh, they were building, uh, putting together bricks. Uh, verse three of Genesis eleven, they said, "Come to one another." Come, they said to one another, "Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly." And they used brick for stone. They used tar for mortar. Uh, and then they said, come, let us build a city. But notice what they're doing. They're using God's resources. They're using uh, these bricks and burning them into a form that they can then stack them to build the city. So they're using God's language and God's resources independently of God's purposes. And so God comes down and he disrupts their language. And so they all woke up in the morning, and all of a sudden, you have now a multitude of languages. We don't know how many, 5, 10, 15, uh, but nonetheless, when they came together, nobody could understand each other, and so they began to form by language groups and then began to move out from there. So God disrupts their world and divides them out. Again, that's the picture of what I'm dealing with here. He disrupts and he divides. He did it in the, in the Garden of Eden. He did it at the time of the flood. He does it here at the time of the Tower of Babel. The Exodus is another account that God disrupted by sending severe plagues that destroyed the nation. And then afterwards, his people were expelled out in a great exodus. So again, God comes down into Egypt and he disrupts their world, the 10 plagues that come upon them. And the 10th plague, of course, we know destroys the firstborn children who were in opposition to God. And then the Israelites left and God even gave them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians so that the Egyptians gave them silver and gold. And so uh, Egypt, by this time, has been reduced, in effect, to a third world country. Pharaoh and his army pursued uh, Moses and the Israelites, tr tried to follow them through the Red Sea. God brought the waters back over them. So Pharaoh's destroyed, the army's destroyed, the nation is destroyed. Economically, they're destroyed and reduced to a third world country. So God comes in, he disrupts, and he divides, and he separates people out. In 586 BC, God disrupted the Judaites and drove them into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. So he comes in because they are living sinfully. They have broken the covenant over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm just blown away by Israel's history. Read through 1st, 2nd Kings, uh, read through 1st, 2nd Chronicles, and you read about the over, uh, over and over and over failure of the Israelites to walk in their relationship with the Lord. And again, part of the cursing aspect that's spoken of in uh, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68, applied because God eventually separated them out for a period of time. It was 70 years. And you think of uh, Jeremiah 25, uh, 11 and 12, this whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation uh, declares the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and I will make it an everlasting desolation. And so God comes into, into Judah and he disrupts their world and he sends a pagan king against them, a man named Nebuchadnezzar who would later believe, who would become a believer. He's in heaven now. You can read about that in Daniel chapter 4. It's a wonderful, wonderful account of Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. But nonetheless, God comes in and he disrupts and he divides them out. He sends them off into captivity. And again, this was because they broke covenant with him and worshipped idols uh, and committed horrible sins, including even child sacrifice. That is a subject I've taught on before, teaching through the Old Testament. And that is so upsetting to think that they would sacrifice their children, that they would cause them to pass through the fire, that they would burn their children alive. How is that not upsetting? And, you know, when I see what God, when I see what God did to the Israelites because of their sin, I, 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 I thank him for his righteousness. I thank him. Uh, and in, in one sense, you, well, I'll just leave it at that.
So again, the pattern that I'm showing here is disrupt and, and divide, disrupt and divide. That's the pattern. Now, those who love God and abide by his word celebrate his actions in the world. We celebrate his actions in the world. We, we know that he is righteous. We know that he is holy. We know that he is just. And when God does this disruption and this, div and this dividing out, we know that that is his work, that he is doing this thing. Now, by far, God's greatest disruption occurred when he sent his son into the world, into Satan's hostile kingdom of darkness, to be the light of the world and to provide salvation to those who are enslaved to sin. John 1, 5-9 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And there came a man sent from, John, uh, sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. And John three nineteen through 21, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who, hate, who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light uh, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And so he comes to liberate the slaves. He comes to, to enlighten us. And we are slaves. We're all born into a slave market of sin. We come into this world born in Adam, born in sin. We are born in sinners in Adam, sinners by nature, and sinners by choice. But at the moment of faith in Christ, we are rescued from that slave market of sin, and we are brought into the family of God. It's an extremely wonderful concept uh, that God would do this by His grace and mercy. We have a wonderful God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 13 and 14, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And of course, in John 8, 12, Jesus declared, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, I am the light of the world. So when Christ comes, he comes as a light in the world, that men might not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. And I have a typo in there I'll need to correct. Now, when Jesus presented divine viewpoint to others, on several occasions it is recorded that a, quote, a division occurred because of him. So notice the language there, that a division occurred. We have over in John 7, 43, and you find this pattern where Jesus comes into a crowd, he begins to preach, and then a few verses later, like here in John 7, 43, it says, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him. A division comes in, disrupts, and divides. John 9, 16, therefore some of the Pharisees were saying this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath, but others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. John 10, 19, John 10, 19, again, a division occurred among the Jews because of these words, because of these words. So Jesus comes in, he speaks truth. He gives light to those who dwell in darkness and who have darkness that saturates their thinking, human viewpoint, and he comes in with truth, and the truth disrupts. It causes division. And as a result of his teaching, we learned that many of his disciples withdrew from him and were not walking with him. I taught through the Gospel of John a few years ago. It was a wonderful study. And in John chapter 6, it opens with Jesus at the height of, of, of his ministry of popularity. Uh, he has many disciples, Many people are, are, are following him, and they're following him not because they want truth, because uh, what it turns out is they want a free meal. They want to, they want to see miracles. They want a show and a, and, a, and, a, and a meal is what they want. And Jesus, as he begins to teach through John chapter 6, he gives some very, very heavy information. And what's interesting is, uh, as you begin to move through John chapter 6, he goes from his pop, from being very popular to where the crowds have turned away from him. And then in John, 60, John 6, 66, it says many of his disciples withdrew from him and were not walking with him. And so it finally gets down to the, to the 12. And Jesus turns to them, he says, are you going to leave too? I mean, it's almost like an invitation, like there's the door if you want to go. 
I mean, it's very, very strong language. But those who were positive stayed uh, with Jesus. Those who were positive to his teaching stayed with him. And on one occasion in, in Luke 12, uh, 51 and 52, Jesus said, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you no, but rather division. See, now that's very plain language. He says, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members of one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. Now listen, Jesus, like God, Jesus as God, wants the family to be unified, but to be unified in truth. But the reality is, is that there are some who will turn to faith in Christ. There are some who will advance to spiritual maturity and others within the members of a household who will not. And to that degree, there will be division. That's the reality of it. That is the reality of it. So again, Luke 12, 51 and 52, where Jesus said, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on the earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. And when Jesus commissioned his, his apostles to go into all the world, they obeyed his directives. And there's a very interesting statement in Acts 17, 6, who described the apostles as men who upset the world. Men who upset the world because of their teachings. Now, as Christians, we are called to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 3. Again, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, but never at the price of God's will or at the price of His truth. Again, never at the price of God's will or at the price of His truth. Now, today, God works through Christians to promote the gospel of grace and biblical teaching. And those who walk with God and teach his word continue to disrupt Satan's kingdom by calling out of it a people for God who are to mature spiritually and to live in the light of Holy Scripture. By learning God's words, Christians can identify worldly conversations and either avoid them or disrupt them by interjecting biblical truth. Of course, not everyone wants to hear truth. And the personal choices of others should be respected. It's called the right of self-determination. You see, God is a perfect gentleman, and he never forces himself on anyone. And neither should we. However, this does not mean that we are to conform to the world about us or surrender our biblical values for the sake of peace. Christians are to be lights in the world, and this means learning and living God's Word and interjecting His truth into our daily discussions and activities. As Christians, we are not neutral. Now, we should be diplomatic. We should be kind. We should be gentle. Again, nothing about having a fist-in-your-face attitude. Uh, there's no place for that. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. But be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, but we are nonetheless to speak the truth, to do it in love, but we are to speak the truth. Again, we are not neutral. We are not neutral. Now, in the future, we know that God will cause further disruptions. You see, he's not done. He has disrupted. He is disrupting. He's disrupting Satan's kingdom of darkness right now. Every time somebody comes to faith in Christ, that disrupts Satan's kingdom of darkness, transfers them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. Bam! That's powerful. That's amazing. So we know that there are present disruptions that are still going on. And in the future, because God isn't done. In the future, we know that God will cause further disruptions when he removes all Christians from the world by means of the rapture. And listen, right now, America is in a state of spiritual, moral, social, and economic decline. We have inflation off the charts. Uh, there is great division in this country. Uh, there are certain political rulers that are causing all sorts of trouble. I believe that they are backed by demonic forces. Uh, that's part of another study I did on angels and demons. Uh, but the reality is, is that right now, if the rapture were to occur and Christians were taken out of America, I wonder if America wouldn't immediately go into a collapse. Uh, uh, seriously, it would have such a damaging, because we are scattered into all aspects of, of society and all uh, aspects of, of industry. 
Uh, and so uh, at the time of the rapture all over the planet, this again is, uh, is a disrupt and divide. God is going to divide us. He's going to separate us out. Now, following that judgment, uh, following that event, the rapture of the church, which we hope for, I hope Jesus comes today. I would love if he came right now. I'd be very happy with that. Uh, but it's in his time and his way. I'm to be a servant of his. I wake up in the morning and I salute the Lord and I say, ready for service. How would you have me serve today? Where would you have me serve? What would you have me do? Um, so uh, until the rapture occurs, we stay the course as Christians. Now, following that event, the rapture of the church, he will send great judgments upon the earth for seven years uh, and upon the wicked who deserve it. And this is during the time of the tribulation. You can read about the seven-year tribulation that will follow the rapture of the church. And after the rapture of church, there is a prophetic event that will start the, 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 the chronological clock ticking, and that is when the Antichrist signs the peace treaty with Israel. Once he puts his little signature on there, then the clock for the seven-year tribulation begins. And the first three and a half years are marked by tribulation. The last three and a half years are really marked by great tribulation. But again, God will disrupt the world. He will disrupt the world at that time. And at Christ's second coming in Revelation 19, the King of kings and Lord of lords will slay all who oppose him. That is, all human forces that gather against him at the Battle of Armageddon, and he will suppress that rebellion, and he will also arrest and confine, confine Satan. You have this account in Revelation 20, uh, where at the end of the tribulation, uh, just at the beginning, really, in that transition in between going into the Millennial Kingdom, where Christ will rule on the throne of David for a thousand years, uh, John the Apostle writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key in the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon. So he arrests him, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And when he is released... Uh, he's going to lead another revolt because a thousand years in prison does not rehabilitate Satan. He is not reformable. Uh, but nonetheless, when Jesus comes back, he will slay all those who oppose him. He will arrest and confine Satan and then establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Now, the reign of Christ on the earth will be a time when righteousness prevails. Isaiah says of Messiah in Isaiah 9-7 that there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You see this in other places like Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And notice that branch there is capitalized because it's a messianic term. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. We need a righteous ruler. And the problem we have today is even if you have somebody that does rise to, uh, to a place of prominence in the land, politically speaking, even if they are a good ruler, eventually they're voted out or they pass away. And so you can't perpetuate that. But with Christ, who is himself eternal, he is the Son of God, theanthropic incarnate in the flesh, the God-man forever, that when he comes to reign, his reign will be perfect. It will be a righteous reign, and it will be a forever reign. And so we look forward to that. Now, afterwards, God will forever separate into the lake of fire all who have rejected his offer of salvation. So again, you have during the time of the tribulation, you have this great disruption. Christ comes down, he disrupts, and he separates. He even divides the sheep and the goats. I mean, he's, there's even going to be a separation there, a dividing there. And then he removes Satan into the abyss for a thousand years. And then afterwards, uh, God will forever separate. He will disrupt and divide all who have rejected his offer of salvation. Because listen, as long as we are alive on this earth and we have breath, if we are, if we are an unsaved person, if we are an unbeliever, if we are still in Adam, then as long as we have breath upon this earth, then we have time. It may not be long. Maybe a few seconds, a few minutes, a few hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades. We don't know. God knows the length of each person's life. But at the moment of death, 
all of life's decisions are fixed. And the one decision of what we do with Christ determines our eternal destiny. And those who have believed in Christ will forever be with him in heaven. And those who have rejected Christ will forever be separated from him. This is the greatest disruption uh, in in the eternal state and separation out where we see where uh, everybody's going to be resurrected, believers and unbelievers. All believers will be resurrected to eternal life. The unbelievers will be resurrected to eternal damnation and separation from God. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds, because that's all they have. If you reject Christ as Savior, then all you have are your deeds, and your deeds will never save you, and you're judged according to your deeds, and you are found guilty, because unless your deeds measure up to the perfect standard of God's absolute perfect righteousness, then you can never get into heaven. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And what's the problem? The problem is that all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy rag, like Isaiah 64, uh, 6 tells us, and uh, Romans 3, 10, that there are none righteous, no, not even one, and that God saved us, Titus 3, 5 says, not on the basis of deeds, because we can't be saved on the basis of deeds. Works never save us. They should follow salvation, but they are never, never, never the condition of it. And so he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of renewing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of works. And so people who think that they can bring their good works to God and put it in a bag and say, oh, get me into heaven, here's the trade-in value. It's not enough. Trust me, it is not enough. The biblical record is clear. Man needs only Christ to be saved, and it is only Christ who lived an absolutely righteous life. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, and 1 John 3.5 all make it clear that he committed no sin, uh, that in him was no sin, that he knew no sin. And Jesus Christ came into this world, that God the Son, at a moment in time, added humanity to himself, and this at the moment of the virgin conception, parthenogenesis, and that, and that Mary was conceived, that there was a, a child conceived in her womb, and this is Jesus, and this was conceived supernaturally by means of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was not involved, now he was there to help raise Jesus. Uh, But nonetheless, Jesus was supernaturally conceived in the womb of Mary. And when he was born into the world, he came into the world minus his sin nature, minus Adam's original sin. And he lived his life in perfect righteousness. Everything he thought, everything he said, and everything he did was in perfect conformity uh, to the Father's will for him. And he lived a perfectly righteous life. And he went to the cross and he died. And he willingly laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. Jesus said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down of my own free will. And he went to the cross and he died a death he did not deserve. He did not die for his own sins. For whose sin did he die? He died for mine. He died for your sins. That's the sin that he took upon himself. And when the sky grew dark from noon to three and he cried out to the Lord, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And to think that he willingly went and died and bore my sin. I didn't ask for this, but this is his grace. And somebody came up with the acronym that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And he paid that price. And we come only with the empty hands of faith. We come only only trusting in him. And he died, and he was buried, and he was raised again on the third day, all as the scripture teaches. And so 
Here at the great white throne judgment, we have those that are resurrected back to life, but having rejected Christ all of their life, they are judged according to their deeds. And their deeds are never enough. It is only the work of Christ. Man needs only Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Going on in Revelation 20, 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Disrupt and divide and separate out. And finally, God will destroy the current heavens and earth and create a new heavens and earth. 2 Peter 3.13 tells us that according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. At which time there will be no further, no further disruptions in the eternal state. Until then, until then, we thank and praise God for his disruptions. I remember the first time I taught this some years ago when I really began to think through this biblically, and and uh, part of this was born out of a study that I had uh, done with uh, Charlie Clough through his Biblical Framework series, which I recommend to everybody to, to go through. It's quite an amazing uh, presentation of material, really helped me. I was a chauffeur at the time when I was listening to his uh, Biblical Framework series, and I was a chauffeur for a little more than a year, about 13 months, when I was in uh, graduate school working on my Master of Divinity. And I had time. I would pick somebody up. I'd go to the airport, go out on the runway, pick someone up off their private jet, take them to a hotel or restaurant or something, and then sit in the in the in the parking lot for hours and listen to these Bible lessons. And I had time, right? So you take advantage. You have to be a good steward of time. But I learned, and I would listen to a lesson a day, and I went through all 224 lessons of his in a year. I think it's 224. But anyway, it was part of that that I came to understand in kernel form this disrupt and divide. And so what I've done is I've unpacked this in places, and we could have looked at other examples in the Bible. But hopefully this is sufficient to demonstrate this point about how God disrupts and divides, and this according to his righteousness and uh, according to his character. So I hope this lesson has been helpful to you. If you've enjoyed this lesson and would like to receive others like this, then uh, by all means, uh, subscribe to my channel, my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, or my podcast, and uh, and you'll get more of these uh, from time to time. I do thank you for taking the time to um, go through this lesson with me. I hope it has been a help to you. If you did like it, please hit the like button below. And I do respond to comments as well, uh, questions and comments. So if you have any and you want to put them forth, please do so. I wish you all a blessed day. Thank you.